Hello and welcome to Practically with me, John Stevenson, with uh, very messy hair this morning. Uh, I hope we're all safe and well. Uh, so this week we're going to do some more exorcism challenges. So we've been going through these. Hopefully you've found them enjoyable. <coughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be back for more. And so this one is called the Spiral Matrix. <coughs> And somebody challenged me to uh, try and explain a, a functional approach uh, because they felt it was quite a, uh, a procedural kind of uh, challenge or it's like very easy to do procedurally um, <clears throat> which it is and it's kind of very easy to go more towards kind of the loop recur or the kind of recursive function uh, but i did manage to uh, do a functional approach um, well, that's not beautiful, but it is uh, a useful example of how to slightly ch change the way you think about things, do a bit of lateral thinking, and then you can uh, do things uh, more declaratively uh, in, a, in a kind of very nice functional approach. So let's uh, let's see what we did. Um, well, before we go, quick advert for me. Uh, so all the information uh, about Practically is on the website, practically, uh, practical.li or practically.github.io. And we've got all the videos, uh, playlists, and so on. Um, I'm going to be adding some more uh, videos to the Clojure CLI tools and Depths Eden uh, over the next week. And uh, yeah, always continuing adding the books. And then there's um, the Data Science um but i'm going to start kind of building some more content up for that uh, and it's really just a race if you've never done data science before this is basically some <clears throat> really simple ways to get started that's the aim of the book uh there is uh some much more detailed books uh if you really want to get, if you want to get serious about <clears throat> uh, data science so there's deep learning and linear algebra um uh, by Dragon. These are excellent books. Um, so if you really want to get serious, then take a look at those. But I'll just be doing some <clears throat> some basics to get you going uh, and show you how uh, easy it is to get to do some data science in Clojure, uh, because a lot of it is transformations. And uh, uh, there won't be too much scary maths in there, hopefully. <clears throat> Uh, and then yeah feel free to reach out to me on any of the channels and support me in whichever way you feel comfortable all right let's get on with exorcism <clears throat> so we go to exorcism.io oh look it's top there in my browser <clears throat> so we're on the closure track um i haven't actually started the emacs lisp one yet uh i'll do that uh, over over the holidays hopefully <clears throat> And it's way down here. Where is it? So I've lost it now. I haven't found a way to like, have a specific link yet on this. <clears throat> but that's a sneak peek of my uh, functional approach. Uh, so we're going to go through that. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it, it's it's a fairly simple uh, problem definition. <laughs> So essentially, we've got. Um, it, it, although at first it was a bit misleading because I thought we were trying to convert a an array into uh, the different things, and what what really we're doing is we can just generate the result. So we're not really taking in this. The tests don't. The tests just give you a number. So like the tests give you a spiral matrix of size three. This is what it would look like if you. Uh, generated it in a spiral form. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it goes around in a in a spiral. <clears throat> and so for four, yeah, one, two, three, four, and then you go down the uh, last row, and then across, and then up, and then across, and then down, and so on and so on. You get the idea. So it looks fairly simple. Uh, and the test suite you've just got so it gives you like a number um so if a spiral was zero that's that's an easy one a spiral of one is, is quite easy as well 
uh, and then it gets uh, a little bit more tricky because then you've got to reverse the, the numbers <clears throat> and then there's uh, 20 as well which is the uh, the modulating one but if you get um, <clears throat> once you've got if you can get three to work then you've probably got the rest of it working as well Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, problem with the microphone. Let's uh, thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so here we go. So how do we solve this uh, issue? So we can generate a sequence of numbers, uh, which are using range one to ten. <clears throat> Hopefully you can hear me now. I know there's like a twenty second delay. Uh, between me speaking and the comments hey they're back there we go uh so yes yeah, so we've got range one to ten which is generating this sequence of zero to nine so the ten is exclusive so it'll generate up to that number but not that number itself and we can pass in range by itself uh if we do that we generate an infinite sequence uh <clears throat> but so we need to uh oops So if we generate an infinite sequence, then we'll blow up our REPL uh, and our Java heap. So uh, we wrap this take around it. So it only takes a, a number of uh, the, the number of elements that we actually want. So um, range that way acts uh, lazily. It'll only do the uh, it'll only generate the numbers that we actually uh, we actually want. So it gives it some context. But we're getting zero to eight. Uh, so if we do, uh, if we take the first nine of one to ten, then that would work. Uh, or rather than just specifying uh, here, we could use range, but actually just skip over the first one. Uh, and so if we do rest of range, then it's going to skip over zero. Uh, and we've still got like a, a lazy sequence of the uh, we've still got a sequence of all the numbers from one onwards and then we just take the first nine of that as well uh, so we get one to nine uh, so I, I quite like that uh, because we we don't know for definite how many we don't know in advance how many uh, uh, numbers we want how many numbers in the sequence we want because we don't know the size of the array until we actually call uh, the function that's going to generate our spiral. <coughs> so we'd replace take with the um, uh, with the size of the matrix we're supposed to generate. <coughs> uh, so we ha if we have a look at the tests, uh, so look at the tests we down here somewhere. Uh, test. 
So if we imagine we're calling spiral with uh, just a single argument, just one. So we want that argument, and then from that we want to generate a matrix, which is fairly easy because we just generate a sequence, but then we need to generate it in a spiral form, uh, which is the which is the tricky bit of this. Oops. Let's get rid of that. <clears throat> So I can create a matrix of uh, uh, kind of yeah of numbers that are in uh, incremental order. So here we're taking the the sequence that we're generating. So this is the one to nine that we're generating, and then I'm just partitioning it by three, which creates these nice kind of three partitions. Uh, which are effectively the rows of the matrix, um, and and then so if we didn't have to create a spiral, then if we just wanted a matrix, then we were we can effectively finished. But we need to try and figure out how to make it uh, spiral. <coughs> uh, so we actually want a rather than having a sequence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We want a sequence of one, two, three, eight, nine, four, seven, six, five for a three by three matrix. <coughs> so I looked at the logic and thought, well, do we take the first row? It is that's easy, uh, and then it's the it's the other this is the rows that we have to do something with. Um, so the second row is the last two digits plus the first one, and the third row is the first digit of the last row plus the last two digits of the second row reversed. <coughs> and some people don't get that right, actually. I've seen some solutions where they don't actually reverse the, the last two bits. Uh, so I, the way I first started, I just jumped in and started trying to do this without thinking about it anymore. And uh, can generate a sequence. Uh, so this actually is what we had before. So we're actually just generating a sequence for spiral one. Uh, this actually passes the uh, passes the first test, uh, so that generates a sequence because we we don't need to do any reversing for zero or one. <coughs> um, but then you could start kind of taking a more uh, so we take that sequence and we want to create a new list, a new sequence. Uh, so we get the first of the sequence, so that's the first row. Uh, and then we reverse the second row, uh, and then this will then pass for uh, the second test. Unfortunately, it breaks the uh, the other tests because we're getting extra um, sequences there. So we'd have to kind of kill all the empty sequences or do some checking around there as well. And this is when it started to feel like it was going to become a lot more, uh, a little bit, a little bit more procedural. A little bit more low level, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, possibly heading for loop recur and maybe a recursive function. So I do have a version of that, but I wanted to focus on the trying to do it as as functional as possible. Uh, to working on, uh, yeah, trying to uh, just do data transformations, making sure like putting the data in the shape that I wanted to so that the actual algorithm was just a simple function call and all the algorithms are really simple. Uh, and so in the solution I've got, everything is simple, but there's just quite a few of them, which makes it feel overall a little bit more complex, but we shall see how you feel about it once we've got there. <clears throat> so we've got a three by three matrix. So this is what it's like if we just do it in, uh, in incremental order. Uh, ascending order of the uh, numeric values and this is the version where it's if we put it in the spiral version um, <clears throat> so we can see we've got this pattern here that we generate uh, from where the position of each of these elements should go when we create the matrix <laughs> That makes me think, think of the film when we talk about creating the matrix. Uh, so if we can generate the following sequence, so if we can generate that sequence, <clears throat> uh, 
and then all we need to do is just uh, kind of pair it with the actual values. <clears throat> then we have an indexed uh, location for where all these actual values should actually go in the matrix. <clears throat> Hopefully that makes sense. So, yeah, so if you've got locations on here, then as we're creating the uh, matrix, then all we need to do is put these values uh, of how big the matrix is. So each element of the matrix, it put it in its position, uh, and that creates our spiral. <clears throat> so that's the idea. Um, although there's a few steps in actually just generating this uh, if we want to do it for any kind of size of uh, matrix. <clears throat> so we want to generate kind of this mathematical pattern for uh, generating kind of the, the locations of the matrix. <clears throat> So I did quite a few steps here. So I'm actually starting to build up the pattern. Um, so I want to, um, we want to kind of get the, uh, these values here, like starting to create this reverse range. Uh, Cause we, we're trying to work towards, actually if I work a little bit backwards, it's, it's a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> so we're trying to work towards uh, this, uh, this pattern here, um, oh, which is actually here, isn't it? So we're generating this pattern of uh, where things are actually going. Uh, I'm sorry, here. Uh, and so when we when we create um, when we start adding these together, uh, this sequence will then give us our locations. So we need to generate that sequence. So we first off start by creating a a range of everything. Uh, but uh, so the sequence uh, in reverse of the size of the matrix minus one. So we decrement the size of the matrix and then we generate uh, this range. Uh, so for uh, <clears throat> so for a matrix of size three, we do two, one. A matrix of size 10, we do nine to one. And we repeat that. Um, so we're just repeating over the range. So we take that two, two, one sequence we've got and we just repeat that. We get two, two, one, one. <clears throat> and then we add back the size of the uh, matrix in the front of it. And so that's what we get for a three by three matrix. And for a four by four matrix, then we'd have uh, this pattern as well, and so on and so on for whatever size you want. So that's kind of half of uh, the kind of pattern that we're making. So this pattern takes this generic uh, cycle we're going to generate, and we're going to combine them, and that gives us the specific uh, look. Well, it gives us the uh, pattern we can use to generate the specific uh, layout of the spiral. Uh, so cycle cycles a useful thing if you want to uh, do a, a repetition so here we're going to create a cycle uh, using these uh, using these values uh, so we've got one three minus one minus three so we just get an infinite uh, sequence again of uh, these values so that's why we're just taking nine the, the size of the the total size of the, the matrix we're generating and then we put these, uh, we just combine these two patterns uh, together to generate our sequence. <clears throat> uh, and so it doesn't really look anything yet, but then we can do a, a nice little trick to actually just make it into uh, the values that we actually want, the pattern that we actually want. Um, Yes, yeah, so this is effectively what we're doing. We're just generating these two uh, sets of data uh, and creating another set. Uh, so that's the actual code we, we're calling. And then we 
can use this pattern here, which is which is taking this general form and a specific pattern for the size of the matrix. Uh, we can take that and produce the locations from that. And how do we do that? It's like magic. There we go. So this is where it, hopefully it starts to make sense. Uh, so we've got this pattern we've generated, which is specifically for the size uh, three by three matrix. Uh, if we reduce using plus, that will give us like a single total. Um, that's, that's not particularly helpful. So what it's doing here is going and adding all these numbers up uh, and giving us a final total. <clears throat> Reductions is doing the same except it's showing all the working. It's showing us the individual values it's created uh, as it's um, <coughs> as it's done the calculation. So rather than returning just five, it is returning five, but it's returning all the other values that it used to get to five. So when it added one together, you got one, you added one and one together, you get two, one and one and one, you get three, one and one, one, one and three, you get six and so on and so on and so on. So hopefully this little sequence is very familiar because that's the actual uh, locations where we want to put <coughs> the, the values. <coughs> Uh, so reductions is really, really simple when you want to see all of the combinations of uh, a reduce. <clears throat> I think there is some, I'll try and dig out the example that I used in the uh, foreclosure. One of the foreclosure challenges uses reductions as well. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so it is quite a, a powerful tool. Um, so there's reduce, reductions, which shows you all the working. Uh, and then there's one to escape a reduce as well. Um, what is that one called? Let's see. So if you can't remember what a function is called, then we go and have a look at closure docs and see the associated ones. There's lots of examples there. Oh, that's quite busy. Uh, yeah, reduced. Yeah. So you can also put in a term, like a way to terminate to reduce as well. So if you want to stop on a certain condition, you don't need to do a loop recur and put a condition in there. You can actually just use reduced. Uh, so that's really good. Um, oh, and reduce. I don't think I've used that one yet. No. <clears throat> Okay, so now we've done a little bit of mathematical magic uh, and we get our uh, patterns together. Uh, so now we've got our pattern for where the value should go, but we don't have the values themselves yet. So this is the code so far. It looks a bit, it looks a bit hard if you just see that cold. Uh, it'll take a little bit of reading. We can make that a little bit better. <clears throat> But let's, let's get on with creating the value. So now we've got the pattern. What we're simply doing is taking this, this pattern here and we're going to associate it with uh, the range of values from one to nine uh, in uh, numerical order. <clears throat> so now we come up with a with sort of mapping vector on that uh, and we're just mapping it with uh, range to the size of the uh, so this is the size of the uh, the matrix we want to generate so we want a three by three matrix uh, and we have to increment that because as we're using range we need to have one value larger than that so three by three is going to generate the number nine uh, so in order to get nine we have to increment that to ten so that range will generate everything up to nine and we start with one because we don't want zero. <clears throat> I guess we could have done the, we could have done the the, uh, um, the rest around that as well. Uh, but this is more, I guess this is more specific. <clears throat> uh, and then we are uh, basically <clears throat> 
combining these. So we create creating a new vector uh, using an element from range and an element from our pattern. <clears throat> so it's going to take a value from each and create a vector from that. And then each each of the vectors gets put into a, a sequence. So we've got one, one, two, two, three, three, and this is this. So that this is the first row of our pattern of our spiral. Uh, so that's the same. And this is where we start to transform it into the actual shape that we actually want. So this is the second row, and we can see we've got nine in the middle, and the third row where we've got four and five. Uh, at the at the and then the last column <clears throat> so that's the right uh shape uh so that's the right um kind of values paired together and then we're just sorting by second so sorting by the actual uh position because at the moment there is uh i suppose i could have done it the other way around um so we've got we've got these two things joined together, uh, and then we are going to switch them around so that uh, we put them in the order in which oh yeah so we put them in the order in which um, of the locations rather than the values. So at the moment in this in this first one they're in the order of the values uh, with the position as the second value. But if we order it by second, if we sort it by the second value, then it swaps over the values and um, we get the uh, array so that um, it, the values are in the, the right uh, kind of location. So now the, uh, the second values are one, two, three, four, five, six, so if we just take the first value of each one of those, then we can basically <clears throat> have our pattern. Um, and then if we just partition that by three, it just gives us the form that we actually use for the uh, test. Uh, so the test is uh, asking us to return things in, uh, it's, it's basically comparing it as a sequence of sequences. Uh, so to put it into that shape, then we're using partition uh, to do that again. So that's our answer. So let's put that together in a function. <clears throat> uh, so, wee! so it's quite a lot of transformation, but basically we're just generating uh, our mathematical pattern here. So I guess we could split this into two uh, things as well. We could generate, we could have split this off and have a mathematical pattern uh, function. And then we could use other mathematical patterns to generate the same kind of sequence. And then we're just putting that pattern, using that pattern to uh, generate the, for the, the values and put the values in the right, the right order. So this is written in the like classic Lisp style, but we can also use, um, well, let's just show you that it still works. I hope it still works. <laughs> there we go. So we've got one, two, three, which is right. And then the second row is eight, nine, four. And the second and third row is seven, six, five. And then we go back up along the bottom row. We get six, seven and up to the middle row, eight, nine. There we go. So it works. Awesome. <clears throat> and so rather than having the Lisp style, we could use a threading macro, and and it looks it looks a little bit easier to uh, kind of understand. And we can also, if we do this, we can do little tricks like uh, commenting out certain uh, parts of it. So what if we didn't sort it by second? We could just uh, comment that out and see if it still worked uh, or see what it does. So it's it's one way to uh, kind of deconstruct what this is actually doing uh, just by commenting out sections of it. So we need to be careful. We can't comment them all out because some of them uh, change the, the shape of the data. So the next function might not work. Uh, but yeah, we could, we could do this without partitioning the size, for example. 
um, and then there we just get this sequence and then if we put partition back in again evaluate that function Boop. Boop. Oh, press the wrong button there we go and then we get it partitioned so it's uh, using a little uh, reader macro comment it's quite useful for deconstructing threading macro things because basically it just skips over this expression so the result this the result that this uh, function generates uh, goes into partition as the last argument rather than going into map first this is just ignored so we can comment one or more of these out um, I think we'll get a very different answer here if we yeah so we get the the full sequence so we can kind of see what each bits doing for us uh, by seeing the results of using it and not using it so that's quite a handy way to uh, play around Whoa, that's quite a lot of transformation but essentially it does hold to the kind of the approach that closure takes in, in it trying to uh, have a very data orientated way so we've created we've basically just created a pattern to generate the function and done some transformations to actually make uh, that pattern into the results we actually want and so while the overall uh, function has quite a few function calls in it uh, and we could probably refine some of these um, each of the functions we're using internally is just a it's pretty much just a simple uh, closure call function with just very simple uh, anonymous functions uh, so even though it might take you like 10 15 minutes to read through it and understand it and play around with it, uh, it we're not doing anything uh, clever and and kind of tricky that takes you hours to try and figure out it, it's very straightforward uh, use of like clo common closure core functions. Uh, reductions is not quite as common, but it is very useful to know. Um, and it does remind me of the uh, the exercise I've got to uh, basically find the most common word in a book. So it's quite a, quite a nice, interesting pattern here, having a pipeline of transformations to get to the result that you actually want. And potentially you could uh, you could maybe even refine this into some transducer pipeline as well and make it even simpler, make it a bit more generic. Uh, cool. Oh, what's the difference between a reader macro comment and the regular comment? Uh, so there are three. Uh, so I'm using uh, so there's the um, there's a, a semicolon, which is obviously the comment, the classic comment of just putting some text in. And then we've got here, oh, we, here we've got rich comment block. Um, oh, that's the end of it. Where's the start of it? So we've got the comment here, uh, which is a comment block, which I use. I use that for uh, commenting out um, lots of code and this this basically i can still go in and manually evaluate the code that's in comment but if i evaluate this buffer if i value if I evaluate the whole namespace this whole file source uh, a file of source code uh, then closure won't evaluate this um, itself and if i run this program it, this is not uh, this is not called it's not uh, it's not evaluated when uh, when i run a program or when i compile this code uh, it's only evaluated when I manually do that and the same for a uh, a reader macro but the the difference between the comment and the reader macro is if I do uh, let's see let's wrap this in here if I put comment in here it will do the same thing to a point in that it will comment this out it'll skip over this code however this is going this is a function call which is the difference between the two and so if i do uh, comment first map let's do that in here um, if 
if I evaluate this, uh, oops, if I evaluate this, then it returns nil. Uh, so it's going to then pass nil into uh, the next. So if this wasn't commented, it would pass nil into partition size, which is not what we want. Uh, it, it, so it's not skipping over the same. Uh, it's not skipping over the code. It's it's well, it's skipping over the code, but it's returning a nil because we're doing a function call. Oops, what did I do there? It's doing a function call rather than doing um, rather than just telling the the macro the reader to ignore it. So that's what the reader macro does. Um, Yeah. So if we, when we got the reader macro, it basically tells it to uh, skip it. Um, yeah. So if I do, boop. Uh, let's do it in here. Boop. If I make this into a reader macro, boop. There we go. Uh, and we try and evaluate that. Um, Oh yeah, so we can evaluate it uh, in line, and it's it's evaluating that manually, and we get the results. So we can still use that. Uh, we can still go in and manually evaluate a reader macro, but when uh, closure comes and reads this code, it will just ignore this expression completely. It won't return anything. Uh, it's as like it it's not actually there. Whereas as comment is, uh, as comment is a function. A uh, function always has to return uh, a value, and so comment and print line and other things will return nil, uh, and so you have to be just a little bit careful on that. So if you put it in uh, like a print line in here, uh, that would not be good because it would return nil. <laughs> um, so that's a bit more challenging. Although you might be able to use tap. I'm not quite sure what tap does. Um, um, that'll be interesting to see. Let's, let's, let's give that a try. Uh, I don't think I've got tap source set up, but uh, set up. so tap is the new kind of the new print line. Uh, and so why is that? Yeah. Oh, it's called with two arguments. Uh, oh, yes. No, tap's not going to work either. There we go. I have to have a look to see if we can use tap some way with that. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so comments, so you've got your three comments uh, code in here. Um, I used to use the I used to use this reader macro quite a lot. Uh, and then um, I did find out about the the comments. And at first, I thought it was a bit verbose. I did I did really like just doing this hash. And the also the nice thing is that you don't have to do it on the same line. So it, you actually, this will still comment out the next expression. So even if this is a few lines down, it, you see it's still, my editor is still interpreting that, interpreting that as being commented out, um, even though it's on a different line. Um, and if you wanted to be really uh, detailed in what you were commenting out, um, so do map ink. Uh, so if you have like, whoop, doo -doo -doo -doo. you can comment out. I think you can comment out numbers as well. Uh, so do hash. Let's go there. So you can comment out a number inside here, and that's going to work as well because it's just going to ignore the three. Uh, so that still works. So we got we don't have a an incremented three, which would be four in this sequence. So that's skipped then out. Uh, and we can actually also double up. This is perhaps not the best example, but uh, so we can double up. And now the four is commented out. <laughs> so that's the same as doing, um, as putting the comment on the four as well. So you can actually double up and it will skip over however many of these. Uh, so if we wanted to comment out the five, I wonder if that's gonna, is it gonna work, oops, oops. Wrong place, there we go. Uh, yeah, that doesn't quite work if you do it that way, but if I did it this way, yeah, there you go. 
I wonder if you, oh, you can comment out. Oh yes, yeah, so it kind of comments out its own comments. Oops, oops. We'll get the right button there. Okay. Yeah, so it's just it's just treating that the whole thing as a as an element as a as a symbol to skip over. So it's quite powerful. Um, and they just make thing, the whole thing a comment. Obviously, like with a double, uh, with a co with a semicolon, then it's just going to skip that as well. So that's kind of like doing the reader macro, except you can't go in and evaluate this now uh, manually. So um, yeah, you got like lots of uh, choices in comments. Cool. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to show the oh the recursive uh, approach. So the the kind of nicest w approach to doing it recursively I've found so far was um, so we've got this rotate. Uh, so we're basically um, using apply map list to rotate a matrix, uh, and then we're reversing it as well. So let's show you what that does. So, let's, um, so if we do. Um, Evaluate that, call this rotate with, uh, yeah, we want a sequence, don't we? Boom, boom, boom. I can't remember how to do this. Oops, do a quote. We're using a list. We need to do a quote. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, I suppose I could have done range there, couldn't I? Oops, I could have done range. Um, oh, what did I do wrong? Uh, actually, let's just walk. Let's just debug this one. Let's walk through debugging. That's quite a nice one. So if we uh, uh, go and debug, uh, so just put breakpoints on these functions. Uh, probably don't need one there, but what the heck? So now when I call this, it's going to step through each of these functions. So you can kind of see what's actually happening. Uh, so this is another way to yeah understand your code or somebody else's code that um, is not quite as clear as just to call it with the debugger on. Uh, so I'm just using the uh, Emacs Cider debugger. Um, and we can just uh, step through pressing next to uh, step through. So we see we've passed in the size three, which is the size of this, um, the kind of the, the sort of the matrix we want. So we want a three by three matrix. Um, and so it, it does have size. So we're going to go off and generate the spiral matrix. Uh, and the spiral matrix is a recursive function itself. So it's going to call itself until um, it basically works out all the Kind of structure of the uh, of the matrix. Um, so we call that with, and it's calling it with uh, two sizes because we're going to actually replace one of the sizes when we recurse around the spiral matrix. Um, so we're we're calling uh, size, and then uh, so we're passing in size twice because we've got this size a new size. Um, I'm sure there's probably a better way to do it than that but uh, when we call it with when we call it in the rotate again then it's going to pass in this uh, kind of new size uh, and size and the start plus size so it's going to modify these each time that's why there's an extra that's why we need to call it with an extra value uh, and then we're just going to basically generate up this uh, set of rows so we're generating the first row and uh, we go around to generate the next row and let's skip over that one there and start building up this kind of this the matrix values uh, and we go uh, and then we get uh, to the end of that so we get to the last number and then it starts calling itself um, through the spiral matrix and basically just reverses these numbers so it starts to generate the, the spiral uh, as we go. So now we're going backwards through all the numbers 
I'm starting to reverse the numbers. Six either uh, eight and seven and nine, six and four and five are together. Uh, we keep on going, generating it. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it's a lot of kind of map uh, uh, applying the map over the reversed matrix each time, and we get our spiral matrix values. So we've got our one, two, three, which is the first row unchanged. Second row with uh, four at the end. Third row with uh, five at the end, and we get the same result. Um, that's it. And then yeah, so we we've, we've got a size. So we if we if the size is zero, then we just return the empty. Uh, the empty sequence. Otherwise, we're returning the we're calling spiral matrix and generating one, and we get our result. There we go. Um, so this is this is quite nice use of uh, this uh, recursive function. Uh, I've seen some like loop recurs, but like uh, so we got loop recur is kind of like the the kind of base level of doing things you can do anything pretty much anything you want to do you can do in a loop recur uh but it, it's kind of the lowest level of abstraction and you're not really abstracting anything uh and then you've got above that you've got things like uh, uh, a recursive function a function that's calling itself like we've got here with spiral matrix it's calling spiral matrix and basically going through the the number sequence uh, one to nine and then um rotating that back and generating the the right matrix uh in the spiral order and uh yeah so then yeah so you've got loop recur uh recursive function and then you've got uh, reduce and map and so on and you've got uh you've also got a, a reducing function specifically as well where you give a function to reduce uh, and then you've got things like transducers and uh, composition and things like that above that as well. So it's, it's useful to try and aim for higher abstractions because it can make your code simpler. And loop recur does tend to direct you to more of a kind of procedural approach. So uh, do this, then do that, then do this, then do that, kind of a, a more of a flow. Uh, whereas with the functional approach, although it looks like um, we're doing it procedural here, this is this is a functional approach because each of these functions is taking some data in and, uh, uh, and then doing something with, the, with that data and returning it. And then we just happen to be passing that data to the next function. So these are all individual kind of separate uh, pieces of the puddle puzzle and then we just use uh, the threading macro or kind of normal list style just to put all those pieces together uh, and we get more much more of a declarative kind of functional approach to the solution well i hope that made sense i hope that hasn't uh, touched your brain too much it did take some thinking about and uh, I, has, I haven't found any other solutions I don't think that I I liked us I got a few I found on the internet um, there's this one that's quite nice I've included that um, is very specific it's very it's a, it's more verbose but it's uh, it's quite nicely uh, written I think it's, it's quite readable um, I think it still takes about the same kind of amount of time to understand uh, and again it's not using anything it's using pretty much the same um, functions it's just broken down more into um, it's probably just yeah broken down into more uh, uh, functions as well so it makes it a little less uh, a little less scary to look at initially um, and that's it Ooh, still got 10 minutes left. Um, if you've still got some brain capacity left, uh, one of the things I did this week was uh, in the Practically Closure book, um, I did some work with the... Uh, so if you go into the Closure tools, there's uh, these data browsers which are quite useful for exploring data as well. 
and so I have done a little video on re reveal and there's also the website's very detailed as well uh, but there's something called portal which is a much simpler to kind of use tool it's basically just a, a way to uh, see and navigate through data so it's quite good for nested data and uh, and lots of data uh, and um, uh, there's a nice kind of online demo you can do uh, and you, you can do it for closure uh, you can do it in a web browser you can do it for specifically for node uh, JS if you're doing closure script on node as well as uh, the web it's got it covered there and I've added uh, aliases as well, so you can run portal, uh, and you can just basically run. Let's make that bigger. You can just run the um, the code. You can just require portal, so you could use this anywhere in your existing uh, development tools. You don't have to start a specific REPL, uh, which you do with re reveal. You can use uh, your existing REPL, and it's just using. Um, uh, portal is what we call a tap source so that um, you basically just require open uh, portal uh, and then add it as a tap source and then you can send instead of doing print line debugging you can send the data into portal and then you can explore in portal so it's like a little, uh, like the closure inspector and other tools are as well um, and rather than do that each time you can you can just add this uh, uh, user namespace uh, to uh, to your project uh, and it's just basically doing the same thing it's just requiring a portal and then it's opening and then it's adding a tap thing and you can also I've also got here I'm using another comment block to clear it and close it as well as so I don't want these to run but it's handy just to have those uh, functions uh, easily accessible so you don't have to go and look them up how to do that and then I'm just starting with uh, starting closure with the uh, dev uh, env dev uh, alias and the inspect portal alias. So this basically adds the uh, uh, like a dev folder to the uh, to the path, uh, and this is adding the the library uh, uh, so we can actually uh, use portal. So it's adding uh, the library as a dependency. And so we can even use this from so when you run that on the command line uh, terminal uh, for Ripple, or you can add that to um, uh, your global option closure. Uh, in, so when you run CIDR, it will run uh, the dev env and the portal. Um, let's see if that's still working. Uh, so let's jump to a project I made earlier. Space L L data inspectors. So let's see. Um, so here I've just got the. Uh, I'm using uh, Emacs Cider. So here I've just got. Uh, I need to change that back again. No, no, there we go. I was trying to do a. Um, I was trying to do a fix with cider. That's why I changed a few things. What I'm doing? Oh yeah, revert. Revert buffer. Let's see if this works. If not, then I'll just do a separate video. Uh, so let's go start a REPL. Uh, I'm not sure if that did. No, I want to do that. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, oh, is that the wrong? Oh, sure, that's the wrong. That's the wrong project. That's not the right project. I didn't prepare this at all. I just thought I'd show you it. But uh, uh, bear with me a couple of seconds. What's going on here? Come on. Come on. There we go. Um, buffer, buffer. Where did we do this? Oh, yeah, it's uh, 
Uh, it's not in that one. Uh, it was in portal. There we go. That's the one we want. Um, I'll push this up once I've got that. So this has got a dev directory and a user uh, um, .crj file. And this is quite a useful trick. So this works for all REPLs. Um, so this is not specific to CIDR or anything. This is just a standard way to to run things when you want the REPL to start. Uh, and there's a few other examples in the uh, in the book, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, let's uh, go back to that. And if we open the source, practically, where was it? Um, and we've got our uh, mdev, so this should uh, it should call the user function because the the REPL goes into um, the user uh, namespace by default. So this is how this trick works. So when you when you start a REPL, uh, if you don't um, change it with lining and then by default it'll always start in the user namespace. So here we're using that trick to basically load in, it's going to call this user namespace because it exists where normally it doesn't. And uh, so then it'll do the require and, and call these two functions uh, that way. So let's see if this works. So if I start the REPL, uh, oh, I think I've broken cider. <laughs> I've broken cider. I will do a video for this. Uh, no, I don't want to reuse it. I have definitely broken it. Oh, I was doing something. Because what it should do is open the browser window and then I can start doing taps in here. So I can start doing uh, a tap into that. Um, and it does work, honest, if you've got a bro, if you haven't broken cider by hacking it. Oof, yes. Um, Let's see if I can do that on the command line. Uh, projects. Uh, 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 closure. Uh, utilization. Uh, uh, so if I do closure, oops, minus M. Oops. And so I'm using the two portal uh, CLI. Two things there. Uh, oh, I got that the wrong way around. Oops. Uh, let's kill it. Uh, MFDEV. Nobody spoiled that, did they? Ah, uh, there we go, it's working. So what it's doing is now is opening uh, this portal viewer, which has got nothing in to start with, uh, but then I can start putting things into the REPL. If I do tap uh, all and S, boom, 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 boom. Uh, true, that returns true, but it also then populates this and starts start exploring uh, the uh, all the data in here as well um, and start getting some information about that. More information than I get just from a, uh, a print line. And uh, I'll put in a link. There was a, like a really good demo of uh, the, the maintainer showing you how to use this as well uh, but it's really simple and easy to use uh, and you can use it with any setup that you haven't gone in hacked and broken the code for <laughs> okay uh, well i hope that was a nice little uh, extra bits uh hopefully uh, you enjoyed this episode uh if so tell your friends and uh Thank you very much for joining me and I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.